Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the panel debate hosted by DBE Careers. Uh, my name is Michael Boyd. I look after WSP's digital services team. And today I'm going to be chairing today's panel discussion. Um, today, we have a very experienced panel, all from different parts of the industry and in different roles, both internal and external facing with clients. And they're going to be answering some of your questions related to the statement that the lack of experienced BIM talent combined with strict salary caps is going to create an even greater challenge for those who are recruiting in 2021. And this is following the release of the BIM salary guide that you might have seen from the DBE Careers website. And uh, so the agenda for today is I'm going to introduce each of our six um, panelists and they will each give a short overview of some of the challenges that they're facing in relation to recruitment of digital and BIM related roles. Um, and that'll give you some time to form some questions. Please add your questions inside of the chat. And um, I'll monitor the chat and I'll relay these questions to the panelists. Um, if you have a specific panelist that you would like to answer your question, please indicate that in the chat and I'll make sure it's directed correctly. Okay, so time to get started. Um, First up, I would like to introduce Alex Parry, who sits within the HR department of WIG UK, and uh, he'll provide a, a good insight from uh, logistics of a sort of recruitment of candidates point of view. Um, so Alex, would you like to take a couple of minutes to discuss some of the challenges that you're facing inside of your business with recruitment of digital and BIM related roles? Yes, of course. Thanks very much, Michael. So um, as mentioned, yes, I'm Alex Parry. So I work for Bouygues Construction in the UK, covering fair, well three different Bouygues companies and focusing on all the BIM recruitment for all the Bouygues entities in the UK. Um, compared to the rest of the panelists, my knowledge of BIM is, is completely minimal. Um, however, my knowledge of the recruitment industry is where I spent about the last 10 years of my career. So hopefully I can uh, answer any questions more around recruitment and HR. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd start for my personal challenges that I and Bouygues as a company have faced, starting actually from early careers and actually progressing on uh, through varying levels of seniority. So I think um, a first real issue that we face tends to be around um, training and qualifications. So there's the digital construction apprenticeship, which is a level three qualification. And then we stretch out more into what would be termed as level five, more of a bachelor's degree qualification. And there isn't really a dedicated BIM bachelor's degree. There is obviously there's architectural degrees, there's civil engineering degrees, and even potentially mechanical and electrical engineering degrees, but nothing that actually sits at level five. And then obviously it progresses on to the level seven, which is a master, there are master's degrees purely in BIM. Um, these are less common and that links slightly onto my next point as well in that I think with a lot of a lot of job roles within the construction industry BIM is no different in that the, while if the theory is there fantastic but the practical application is actually where a lot of people tend to learn and tend to progress into good quality BIM professionals um, and so the level three apprenticeship I think is fantastic However, I think the lack of a level five apprenticeship where people can actually do a lot of on the job training um, really hinders people who are early in their BIM career and may potentially, if someone doesn't excel very quickly, they tend to see a bit, I, I find there tends to be a bit of a candidate drop off after two years in BIM, they may not like it or they may not have had the best experience and they can tend to then leave, the, leave BIM as an industry, which, you know, is, is terrible really. You can get some very talented people who just don't survive in the first two years. Um, and I think that's partly um, a problem that uh, of employers, um, I'm not sure if my panelists would agree on this, but I think as an employer, I think every, uh, well, we probably should be a little bit better with people in their early careers within BIM and a little bit more forgiving because we, no, there's it's difficult to transfer the skills and training into the real world environment. Uh, I don't know if, if like I said, the other, the other companies my panelists work for are, are the same. I do find that's a slight problem we have in that you know, if there's a lack of pure quality BIM training early doors, uh, and then there's a lack, then it's difficult to transfer the skills to that real world. 
junior professionals tend to just drop off and it's, it's no good, quite simply. Uh, and then as we progress into the BIM coordinator, scene coordinator uh, and above levels, I find there's a lot of disparities between companies in job titles. Um, I find some companies hand out the BIM manager job title a little bit too easily in my mindset and that actually, whereas what we would call a BIM coordinator, it could be a BIM manager elsewhere after a very short period in their career. You know, if someone is, I personally want them to go from a manager to a coordinator title. However, if there's the disparities in titles between contractors, um, then there can be some serious problems in people being almost over over promoted in title quite early. Uh, another challenge I see in the industry is is rapidly rising salaries. I think salaries are going up very quickly for people. Far quicker, for example, than if you have X amount of years experience in another area of construction. I think salaries going up, it, it's it's part and parcel of there being a bit of um, lack of, a lack of talent in the industry. Salaries go up at while companies compete until the point where at some point the bubble could could potentially burst um, or people get stuck in a, could be stuck in a company bit on a slightly inflated salary and not continue progressing there. And then the final final one that I find as well is that the part, well, final issue I find is that digital talent is obviously it's an extremely valuable commodity, not just in the construction industry, but in all industries. Um, and that, you know, particularly in tech, in finance industries, that's where digital talent is really valuable. And to, to put it slightly more bluntly, construction isn't as sexy as those two, as those industries. And, you know, some people still have a perspective of construction being, you know, your, your you know, your horrible, smelly, dirty bricklayer sitting in a portal loop. And it's not, you know, construction obviously people who work within the industry actually see that it makes a real difference and see the variation in the industry. But I think as an industry, promoting construction as a viable career path is something that has improved in recent years, but I think there's a lot more room for improvement moving forwards as well. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really the five issues, the, well, five challenges I find when recruiting in BIM. Um, Good. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. So, Next, we have uh, Andy Buttel. So Andy's head of BIMIC here, and uh, Andy has over 19 years experience in the construction industry with a background in mechanical engineering, CAD and project management. Currently, he's head of BIMIC here, and he leads the strategic implementation of BIM and is part of the core team uh, responsible for delivering the business's digital strategy. Andy, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, yeah, and some I think Alex made some really really good points. I'll probably I'll pick up on some of those in in from my experience as I go through. But um, certainly, uh, you know, going back to the sort of the, the problem statement um, introduced in this session, what I see is that, that you know that there's definitely good talent out there. Um, I think through last year, we uh, a lot of people stayed put um, rather than potentially looking around because of the uncertainty. Um, but but there was. You know there were candidates, and we were on the lookout for a few uh, a few positions for coordinators and managers, um, uh, and it was tough. And it's definitely a buyer's market out there at the moment. Um, th those that are looking, um, quite rightly, are, are probably asking for a bit more with a bit less experience. Is what we've seen. So I think um, recruiters have to have to sort of take it on the chin and either either pay a bit more for what you'd normally be expecting, or you know have a concede that okay we're not going to get the breadth of experience that we might be looking for but we can see the you know the traits and and you know there's certain things you can learn on the job and we'll, we'll run with it and that's some of the decisions we've made um i mean we in care so so i don't recruit directly um, um but I, I support our uh, our business units when they're recruiting for bim roles so i'll, I'll help with interviewing on boarding so i was I've got quite a good picture of um, what's out there. And we, quite honestly, we struggled last year. Um, God, I, I lose count of how many uh, teams interviews we did for one position, probably went on for the best part of a whole year. Um, partly that was probably because we were advertising for a coordinator, coordinator where we really wanted a manager. Um, that got resolved, but still it was it was really tricky to get someone. I'm glad to say we've got someone in position now who's, who's pretty really good. So uh, that's rewarding. 
the some of the problems we faced, um, and again last year, is we suddenly lost a few people from the team um, at different levels, um, all in quite quite close succession. And picking up, I think, on Alex's point, um, some of some of that was due to some of our sort of coordinator roles and grades. Quite honestly, when we and we, we it's quite useful. We use the uh, the salary guide, DB salary guide, to benchmark our current grades and the and the sort of salary bands. And we did find that around that coordinator uh, level, we, we were probably the glass ceiling was a bit low. Um, so we used that and did an exercise to raise the bar a bit, so we can start, you know, help hopefully retain. And attract people in in those kind of grades ahead, um, but yeah, going to the digital apprentices. So so we a couple of years ago we launched the a digital construction apprentice scheme, and we we brought on a cohort of um, we've had two or three cohorts now. Our first cohort was a six. Um, they were deployed, uh, mentored, and line managed by some of our bin managers on projects. Really, really good new talent, and we've now lost all six of those to um, other organisations. Um, and you know, it amazes me. One of Alex's points: they've gone from a, you know, an apprentice level with under two years' experience in the industry to, in places, they've gone straight in as a bin manager, over doubled their salaries. Um, and that's the that's the, the market we live in. I mean, we, 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 we've we've done a bit of looking in the mirror in Keir to see what we can do to retain, but there's not a lot you can really do against that. Quite honestly, um, mm. thinking holistically, but we you know we're, at least we're bringing talent into the industry, so. Let's not get too upset about it, but it is a challenge. Um, and I think the bit we've struggled with is, yeah, there's the the level three apprenticeship piece. But as Alex rightly said, there's that next level and and, and looking at um, career progression and, and a route through the business is something that we, we, we need to do, I think, to, to help retain because we don't want to stop bringing in new new people. Mm -hmm. uh, the, what else do I want to say? So... I th yeah, I think going ahead and, and at the moment I definitely see there's there's demand for project-based roles and I think that's only going to grow. Um, but also I, I do think that the more uh, business-wide central functions, um, overhead typical type roles, not project costed, um, th there's definitely not much of a demand for that at the moment um, and we'll see how that goes. But quite frankly, you need, you need people in both positions if you're going to take this stuff seriously and and do transform transformational change but that's my thoughts thank you that's great thank you very much andy so uh, next up we have chris crooks who's managing director at bimbox and um, chris is a bsi associate consultant and leader in the digital construction and information management and he's working with some of the largest consultants contractors and estates team in the uk and his key areas of focus are increasing organizational resilience future proofing work streams and helping to deliver projects more effectively. Um, so as managing director of BIMBOX, he leads a dedicated and fast growing team of BIM consultants. So Chris. Thanks Mike, you know, you know more about me than I do. Um, that's great. Um, yeah, just to give a bit of background. So we are a relatively small business, there's 15 of us. We're not huge, but we are looking for similar skills and, and talent as some of the organizations represented here. We might have turnover in the in the hundreds of millions. So it's it's particularly challenging for us. And I, I just want to spend five minutes talking about um, my take really on the current pressure points and the problems and, and what's happening within, within digital construction recruitment at the moment, from, from my point of view. So just rewinding slightly, uh, we all remember the construction strategy document 2011 and the notion of a BIM mandate and everyone got scared that they would be disenfranchised from centrally funded projects by 2016 if we weren't BIM capable. People reacted in different ways. Some people uh, trained their existing staff. Some people just ignored it. It's all smoke and mirrors. It would go away. It's another sketch up. Some found new staff. And some of the more well resourced threw loads of money at it. Um, and word got around the industry about these guys who were suddenly now earning six figure salaries. Um, and less was said about the army of tiny guys on 25K. Uh, and this created some fairly unrealistic salary expectations. And I don't know that mandate passed. The world didn't end. Um, partially because government departments hadn't quite worked out what they wanted. Um, and there were quite a lot of very highly paid employees suddenly need to justify their employment and their salaries. And some managed it, but there was a huge amount of churn because the investment made wasn't sustainable and uh, the value of them was misunderstood. We fast forward to now, what we're seeing is, is two competing business models. 
We've got those who, um, as Andy was just saying, have been employed off by a main contractor, allied to a project with a project cost, um, paid very well. And um, what they often expend was that project ends and not want to go on to. They may no longer be employed, and they will jump from business to business. And in the, uh, in the second camp, we've got those mainly put out design or industries with slightly different business models who are looking to get into a business and grow and develop gradually, creating a mutually beneficial relationship. We're looking for people in that second camp, and um, it can be difficult because you know money is very attractive, it turns out. Um, it is difficult for us when we get people who come in and say, well, in my last job, I was on 80K, so I'm looking for an increase of that, and I want a car. Um, when I've got guys doing exactly the same role on, on 30 or 35K, and I, I can't you know, upset my team by bringing somebody in an equivalent role on two or three times the salary of people who are doing the job very well. But what we can do is offer long-term employment and, and growth. So we've been thinking a lot. We're recruiting at the moment, and it is hard. Um, what do we actually want? You know, and a big consideration for us is that BIM digital consultant is evolving at an ever increasing rate. The ISO's out with hundreds of pages of BIM framework documents. Kobe might hopefully be changing. We've got a construction playbook, putting a rocket behind it all. Um, BIM professionals who are considered excellent now and probably worth every penny, absolutely, if not more, um, may not be in the near future if they're not constantly evolving and adapting to the passions, keeping up with everything that's going on. So then on a more macro scale, um, the wider aims of BIM are changing. We were all about efficiency at the start. How do we do a quality product cheaper and faster? Um, how do we get collaborate better, be more holistic with all that breaking out of silos? Well, now we can see that we're going to be asked to look at more of the value test. Um, we're going to have to start looking at the human aspects of projects, the social aspects, environmental projects. And to understand the value case of a project, you're going to need ever increasing amounts of data. Um, so, that data is going to have to be more pertinent. It's going to have a broader scope than ever before. And it isn't beyond the realms of possibility that our customers realize the true value of that data, and we educate them, hopefully, um, that an employee with great data skills may soon have more value than somebody who can knock out a killer Revit model. And we're trying to think about that. How do we find those people? How do we look at what's happening in two or three years' time? Finding people who've got experience in BIM, um, which is constantly changing, with construction experience, and have a head for data, is, is very difficult. We can't base it on today's requirements, so we need people with an innate adaptability. We're trying to grow our team um, because the center of excellence cut through the noise, give our clients the best advice. Um, so, you know, it's hard. What, what are we actually looking for? What do we advertise? We don't even know the roles in the industry. Do we want a BIM consultant, a BIM manager, a BIM specialist, a technician, a coordinator, a digital construction consultant? I think we've got to try and hone it down what, what these roles actually mean. Um, and do we want somebody with a background in architecture or from a contracting background? You know, what is it we're after, after? What we've come to realize is that we probably need to place more emphasis on looking for characteristics. You know, we want communicators with long-term career goals who so have that innate adaptability, who want to learn, keep improving, technically-minded people who can translate the information they're looking at and can take a variety of teams um, with a wide range of skills on the project journey. Sad that I wrote this down here, but we have come to realize that the soft skills can be the hardest to learn. Uh, the, the software skills that are easier to, to teach. So there is, we're seeing a skills gap, we're struggling to address it. And within the parameters of our business plan, we've got to, we've realized we've got to be a training center. We've got to get people in with realistic expectations who possess those characteristics, who are willing to learn uh, and bring them through with us. Uh, we've got to have a hardcore team to train and develop. But thinking of an industry, I think we all want a long career on a high salary. And how do we get to that? And I think, as we've touched on before, we've got to educate our clients and our client supply chain on the value of what we're doing. You know, it isn't just about ticking the bin box. Um, it's about understanding the value that we generate. And that value starts manifesting as tender requirements with a cost against it. That will trickle down and we can hire higher quality, more experienced people. And as a result, salary. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much for that, Chris. Um, so allow me to introduce Elliot Crossley. So Elliot is uh, BDP's Digital Delivery Director and he acts as an ambassador for the advancement of the design and delivery process. Um, 
through digital means, managing strategic use of technology across project teams, supply chains, and wider industry partners to inform best practice and identify emerging areas of opportunity provided by digital tools. So Elliot, would you like to take a couple of minutes to discuss some of the challenges that you're facing with regard to recruitment? Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm probably going to end up echoing a lot of what Chris has said there, but you know, potentially from a different scale. You know, we've got probably 12, 1,200 people or so at BDP, um, but the challenges are similar to, to as Chris has, has highlighted there for us, uh, which are probably slightly different from the contractor um, kind of uh, companies that we've got here. But I think to start with, I think there's, there's almost a fundamental problem with the question that has been posed here, where we're bundling boom talent as, as one thing. And I don't know that, that we can agree on what that means. Uh, and I think Chris has touched on some of that. I think with bundling it all together means that actually you're never going to be able to agree any ranges of salaries or, or any specific roles. And I started to just brainstorm how that plays out here, because I think that the competency charts that I've kind of got up in here that, that DBE have, have come up with, look at the, the BIM technician to BIM coordinator to BIM manager type roles, which is great. And as, as a bit of a litmus test of where we can sort of pitch people, I think that's a, it's a fantastic resource. I think we also then have almost a BIM support function, which is separate to those roles, which is about how we train and mentor people in, in our project teams. But then equally, probably more importantly, actually for us in the design realm is all the specialisms. And they all seem to be falling outside of the traditional architect and engineering teams. And those are things, and I've just, as I said, brainstormed, we've got advanced modeling, complex geometry, content creation, parametric content, data architecture and data management, the whole visualization, immersive environments, VR, AR, visual programming, scripting, coding, software development, sustainability and whole life costing, manufacturer, fabrication, automation, machine learning. There's all this other stuff that doesn't naturally fit within our um, traditional professions. And I think all of that is part of the problem that we don't know where these things land. Um, and if we bundle all that into the same BIM kind of category, we're never going to crack the problem. Um, uh, and so I think, so my first point is about defining what it is we're trying to recruit, what is the skills we need. The second part of it is, uh, is, is, is similar to, to, to Chris there, is about the skill demand is ever changing. You know, if you look back a year ago, what we were looking for is probably different to what we're looking at now. And the list of things that I reeled off there is probably symptomatic of that. So actually, the the software competencies and the technical ability is probably secondary to you know attitude personality ability to adapt to change those are kind of the core um kind of traits that we're looking for in people and all of that what we can do within a business and within leadership of a business is set the culture and the tone of our studios to to breed that um, kind of environment um, and i'm quite proud to be on what we've called bdp belonging which is our kind of inclusion and diversity network um, uh, and to take you back to the start of BDP back in the 60s BDP was set up with all professions to be in one house so we've got you know architects engineers uh, planners uh, landscape architects you know, the, the specialisms that I talked about there um, and, and the whole point was the founders saw these barriers in industry being created and, and thought that was a problem and I think that's interesting now to look at the whole point of what BIM is today about bringing um, driving value through the industry and digitizing the industry. It's all about bringing down those barriers. Um, and, and so in some ways, you know, the industry hasn't changed in, in 70 years and we're now seeing technology as a way to enable that. But it's still all about the people. You know, the successful projects are the ones where you've got a really diverse set of backgrounds and a diverse set of skills. Mm -hmm. You can glue those teams together, you get far better outputs um, than, than, than maybe we had before. Um, and, and that works, you know, collectively for businesses, you know, we, we, we deliver better products, so clients get more value, but equally for individuals, you know, teams that tend to be more diverse with those backgrounds and skills seem happier, you know, it seems to work better if you can make it work better. So I think there's, there's value in that. So I think first point was about defining the problem. Second point was about diversifying sort of the teams and the skills. And then my final point is about organizing all of that, because at BDP, which I know different, is different to some of the some of the, um, the panelists here, 
we don't have a profession or a, a group necessarily that just does BIM. BIM is the process and it's part and parcel of everything that everybody in our business is involved with. Now, yes, we have a BIM management kind of group, but they tend to sit as part of the architectural team or the, or the services team or, or whatever it might be. Um, and I think that if we can, um, coming back to, to Alex's point first about recruitment, if we can almost agree some a rough framework of where these people sit in a business structure, that would help us figure out where a career path could be. Because what we see is people learn their trade in a particular profession and then almost jump ship into a BIM role. And I think that that's a problem because it means BIM teams are always going to be pretty top heavy. And we haven't quite cracked the route yet from, you know, from education to a graduate level and how you develop and mentor people through that system without going through a, you know, an RIBA type qualification or a, or a CIOB or RICS or whatever it might be, which is the traditional route. Um, so, that, you know, I think this is an interesting discussion to get to get a bit of consensus about where we go and how we could structure that. But I think my three takeaways are define the problem, diversify your teams, and then look at your business structure and how you organize these people and where do they, where do they sit in the mix. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Elliot. So next up, we have Gary Fannin, who's a director at EXI Digital. Uh, Gary has a broad experience in the construction industry, and he started off in production through design management and digital construction, and his current role is director of EXI Digital, and that allows him to deliver successful digital strategies and associated implementation roadmaps to enable businesses to move forward towards their vision. Gary, do you want to take a couple of minutes? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, so, so for me, historically, there's a, a lot of good points that people have said there, Chris. I think yeah, a lot of stuff you said echoes with me. Um, so hist historically, for me, um, generally most of my career has been working within a main contractor. Um, when that recruitment process started, was trying to get the, the the same type of people, and what we found is. In the early days of, 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 the, of the BIM world, when, when the mandate landed, and obviously there was a rise or a groundswell around delivering digital projects, we needed to recruit. And what we found were people with really quite a diverse range of skills. And we found it um, tricky to find the same type of person in, in, in a large contract. You'd want the same type of skill set in each of your businesses. And that was really difficult. You couldn't find the same type of people. So, so training and education historically for, for me has been hit and miss. It's been generally driven by uh, software vendors, software resellers. There, it wasn't accredited under UCAS. It's got better though. We, we've, we've found that now with the new, edu obviously universities have realized the opportunity for them to start delivering digital and BIM degrees. The new school coming through, there's more consistency in their skill set, which is great. We still have a plethora of people out there with a really broad range of skills. But then we look at how the BIM role uh, within a business and how that BIM role functions. And one of the challenges we had was to prove that that BIM role was delivering value. Because we're doing loads and loads of stuff. Not many people knew what we're doing. Not people, not actually many people understood what we were doing. And you've got the commercial people looking over your shoulder going, what is this guy doing and why are we paying him X? No one's actually saying, look at the value I've delivered into this business. Look at the money I've saved you by doing what I do. And that's one of the things I did working for a previous main contract was to prove to the commercial team that we were faster, that we were delivering better quality and we were delivering more profit. And at that point, and that took a while because you've got to, you, you've got to have a, a, a throughput of these projects. Um, but we put metrics in place to prove you know, that, that, that a digital project was going to deliver better outcomes. And that puts the commercial team's concerns at rest. But there is always going to be a tension between existing digital roles and the traditional roles within, within a main contractor or within a, within a design practice. So that value proposition for me was really, is really important to, to demonstrate the value you bring in and that value proposition to a business. And, and the final one, I like what Chris said, our clients are so hit and miss. And what we find is they are advised early doors with uh, could be a project management team about their new facility, their new building, their new estate, and BIM is not even on the page. So it's only at a point in time when maybe a main contractor gets involved who says, oh, by the way, what about that digital BIM stuff? They go, we're not really considered that. It's not on our page. If you want to do it, crack on. 
So we, we, we then have hit and miss. So a main contractor or even architectural practice has got BIM jobs and non-BIM jobs. So all of a sudden we're going old school, new school, old school, new school. And that, that doesn't give us consistency. And it doesn't give us consistency in our, with our digital roles being uh, dropped from, uh, from one project to the next. So, so for me, the three points really is, is getting consistency in, in, in training education demonstrating the value you're bringing to that business and reminding people the value. It's a, it's a little bit of self-promotion to make sure you reinforce the message. This is the value we're bringing. And at every opportunity, educate clients about the, the new world. And uh, we f I find more and more, even though we've got mandates, there's bad advice out there because the people giving that advice don't understand it either. So that's my last piece. Great. No, thank you very much, Gary. Um, so last but certainly not least, we have Trevor Strachan, who's a director of BIM at uh, Baker Hicks. Uh, Trevor's a, an architect to trades and he's pushed the use of technology throughout his career, creating many sort of three, four, five and six D models. Um, after sitting on the BIM steering group at Morgan Sindel uh, Group Businesses in 2012, Trevor was appointed a head of BIM for Baker Hicks, uh, pushing forward modeling capability within the business now he's a director of BIM and he leads a team of talented BIM professionals who deliver value using digital and virtual technology to benefit everyone. Trevor, can you give us your opinions on, on this statement that it's going to be a challenge through 2021? Thanks very much, Michael. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a slightly different thing here and share my screen with some slides and that's because I'm hopeless at presenting without, so hope you'll all forgive me. So hopefully you can see that. Can you see that okay, Michael? It has not come up just yet. It's not coming up through. There we go. Just there we go. Up. Lovely. Good. So I thought I'd give a wee bit of context, first of all, about where my opinions come from, because I've worked with the same business now for 13 years. Um, so my opinions might be um, just forged from, from that career that I've had. So it was Baker Hicks, we're part of a bigger Morgan Sindel group. So I'm used to be part of a big PLC, a big entity. Um, Baker Hicks is also quite a big business in itself in that we've over a thousand employees across the UK and Europe, um, which is a huge amount of staff and, and the most important office is obviously Motherwell, where I'm, where I'm based. And in there, we've got a variety of disciplines within the business, one of which is BIM, but we've also got our fellow disciplines, architecture, which I used to be in, um, and all sorts of engineering as well. Okay, so that's the context behind where my opinions maybe stem from. and. Uh, this being the question, the lack of experienced BIM talent combined with strict salary caps will create an even greater challenge for recruiters in 2021. Well, my direct response to that is, I think there's plenty of talent out there. Um, we just need to nurture and develop this into the experienced BIM talent for, because talent means natural aptitude or skill. And I wanted to explain a little bit later about experience that I've had recently and trying to bring some graduates into the business. So before I do that, I did a bit of research in preparation for this and uh, found out the top five reasons why employees want to leave their current role. And it was interesting because these are some statistics, not across construction or BIM, this is just generally across the industry. And in 2020, I actually dropped to 21% of people were moving because of salary. So that actually means in 2020, there was 79% that didn't that moved from it for other reasons. So, um, but I think there's one one main reason that's missing off of this. Uh, I don't know if anybody else can uh, appreciate this, but their boss, I think your line manager really has an impact on, on how you enjoy your work and whether you want to move on. I know in early parts of my career, um, I thought of, of moving for that very reason, as I'm sure others will uh, testify as well. So leaving that aside, in terms of salary, well, if we put salary to the side, what other things do people consider when they're, they're looking at a new role? Uh, so it's not just about the money, it's about work-life balance. You know, in terms of importance for employees, that seems to be a lot more important to them than the employers. Um, challenging a challenging role, career development, you know, all these things, benefits package, we can, we can target those as well to try and entice people um, to come and work for us. What we don't need to do is, as it turns out, is focus on our brand. That seems to be important for employers, but not employees. So for me, it's, it's more than just a salary. 
this is about a career. It's not just about a, a job. And particularly within BIM, I've got a huge passion for it. And I see that as, as being my career all the way through to retirement. I want to enjoy that. I've spent 30% of my life working. I want to enjoy it, not just uh, look at my bank balance at the end of the week after a torturous month. What we would need to do, I think, is invest time in upskilling teams. And uh, through that investment in time, if we go back one, it's, it's not just about putting people on training. It's not just about offloading that to others. I think it's about leadership and about serving the team so that they can deliver the full potential. And I try and invest as much time as I can, not on projects, but on teams and on individuals so that we can progress them through their career and they want to stay with us. Um, I think for short-term resourcing problems, contractors are the best way to overcome that. We've got a good network of contractors that we use that are their own independent businesses, and we pay them good money to come in and help us overcome those real uh, peaks and troughs in our resource profiles that we all experience being in construction through delays and through getting a contract and expecting to work on, on it tomorrow. Um, but really, where we are um, moving towards, and I'm interested to hear, uh, you know, Andy's view on this, as he mentioned, he's, he's lost out with six people coming into his business recently. So my views may be naive, but we um, have got a new graduate scheme for, for BIM graduates to come in the business, and we've got 27 different applicants at the tail end of last year, whittled that down to seven, and the potential in those seven candidates was unreal. We were only going to take on one graduate, now we're looking to try and take on two, and I think these graduates are our next directors. I really believe that. And I think that um, I'm going to try and, and make that their career so that they do that within Baker Hicks to be a director in Baker Hicks um, within 10, 15, 20 years time, because the, the potential and the passion that they had and the mature conversations they had with me, I was absolutely blown away. And finally, bringing, Chris mentioned this as well, pay gaps. If we are bringing in big salaried, um, graded staff that are doing senior BIM coordinator roles, BIM coordinator roles. We're creating a big pay gap between them and our existing teams. And I need to make sure that my existing teams are um, happy and they, they've got their career and I'm developing their career with them. If I'm bringing in big pay gaps, then I'm creating a whole host of problems within my teams and, and I want to avoid that because um, I want to be fair. I want to pay um, a good wage and get good uh, career growth within everybody in the team and deliver each of their potential. So I thought we'd just leave it one thing is something that Richard Branson said that I think really resonates with me is train people well enough so they can leave, but treat them well enough so they don't want to. And I'm gonna end on that. That's great. Thank you for a very positive sort of few minutes there, Trevor. Um, no that was great. Um, do you want to stop sharing your screen? So yeah, you the chat? I'll do that That's now. Fantastic. So thank you very much for that. Now, now it's time to get into some of the, the questions that have been fielded in the chat already. Um, before we jump into those questions, I have one question I'd like to field to Alex. Um, Alex, from a recruiter's point of view, um, do you find that the, the salary guide that's been uh, pulled together and shared with the industry from DBE Careers is reflective of what you're seeing from candidates asking for? Um, and does that present a challenge to you as a recruiter? You're muted. Can I just make sure if I shop, stop sharing now? I'm not used to Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting then. Um, so yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I would say the information is fantastic as a starting point. Um, what I would say is that there's some areas that I question, for example, dr drilling into slightly on the nitty gritty of the um, salary guide. For example, under BIM manager, there's one heading which is for an advanced beginner, which for a BIM manager, would we particularly be looking for an advanced beginner to, to take a role like that um, but I think it's a very very strong starting point I think any organization worth their salt should be looking at that and ensure and putting their people against certain headings in there and 
making sure that their salaries were at least you know, coming close to, if not matching those salaries. However, the only slight negative I would say is, is that you know, I feel that is, the, that is a reflection of what people are currently paying people. To move, uh, particularly at the moment in what is a very scary world, we're up until very recently been having bad news sent to us literally daily, um, just from, from, from the outside, from COVID and everything that goes along with it. People aren't moving for the same salary. People are staying secure, even if they're slightly unhappy in their role. They're staying in a role where they're secure um, and where they're relatively happy or at least safe. So uh, to make someone move, normally there has to be uh, uh, anything between a 5 and 10% salary uplift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's good. Um, Andy, I'd like to bring you into that uh, answering that question as well you mentioned that you uh, you lost some apprentices moving into senior roles um can i get your view on on that that salary indication and if if, if that was the primary reason for them moving i don't for, i don't think it was for the apprentices when we looked at the did the um, the benchmarking we weren't yeah we were within what the market rate looked like but i think yeah just generally as we've sort of covered, you know, the, the demand and the, you know, bringing in new talent um, who's got some experience and, and you know, the, I think um, Trevor touched on it. So some of these people coming in and our, some of our cohorts, they've come in from like, you know, someone who's working part-time at Halfords, you know, no, com completely different industry. One, one, one girl or guy was from a garden centre. They've come in within six months. They're absolutely lighting, lighting the place up and, you know, inspiring people. Um, so we, yeah, we do have to sort of have a bit of a recognition that there's something we need to do to retain these people or, or support them and give them a career, proper career direction. I think that's where we were a little loose. Um, I mean, our, our hope with it was that we'd bring these apprentices in, they'd work within the BIM teams, and then actually then, yes, if they really wanted to, they could then be, become a fully fledged coordinator of input or, or what have you and, and go that way. But wouldn't it be even better if they then decided, I want to be a QS or a design manager or you know go and then take that learning and then you know really uh, in, in, a, in another discipline go and go and support and upskill um, so so yeah there's I think yeah, there's some some mapping we need to do there just going back to the point where um, where we yeah, where we did find it useful yeah it was those co coordinator and so we've got senior coordinator two kind of grades roles um, in our teams and those are the ones that we were um, hemorrhaging people and and that was because actually we when we looked at it we were probably b a bit below market rate so so mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that that enabled that conversation with hr to go come on we need to we need to up this a bit if we're going to really retain and, and grow people through so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that was useful oh, that's great that's great thank you so now on to some of the sort of attendees questions uh, and i'm going to fire the first one over to gary fannin um so gary in your presentation you noted that you know training was previously de defined by vendors uh, is getting better there's more consistency so our first question from graham stewart is what accreditation skills knowledge and experience do we feel is relevant in today's market in relation to those in sort of digital and bim roles well, well it's, it's historically we we had people with varying uh, experiences on varying various pieces of, of, of software so we, we were trying to get that person replicated in, in several businesses and that wasn't that wasn't uh, easy to do but obviously now with the, the likes of uh, the UK BIM Alliance the BIM framework uh, they've now got standard approaches to BIM professionals so uh, BSI do it um, uh, building smart and now I've got uh, certified and accredited BIM roles so so the, the world has moved on it, it, it's good that we're at that position because we've got a clear line in the sand of, of what this this position is mm -hmm. so um, so yeah it, it, it's moving on it's moving the right direction and um, obviously now the new school coming through going through university have these degrees we just need that consistency for, for the for the basic bin manager that can be dropped onto any project you know what you're going to get and then there's enhancements of those skills as we touched on earlier with with specialisms okay no that's great so I that's answer the question it, it does it does yeah so elliot do you mind if i get your sort of take on that um 
do you see value in some of these sort of uh, course accreditors and, and sort of certified courses that are in the industry just now? And is that something you look for within BDP? I mean, I think there's definitely value there. You know, people coming out that are going to have a certain grounding, which is which is beneficial. Uh, it, it's interesting. We're going through a similar conversation with a client of ours who have got uh, almost agreeing rates of our staff uh, against certain criteria. And one of those from a BIM point of view was about having a, a and I won't name the particular course, but it was having a, a, a course sort of a certified from a particular provider. Um, so we've been having a dialogue with them around, you know, these things are, they're very new. They're not particularly mature. There's a lot of them on offer that, that you know, some probably better than others. Uh, and actually some of them are, you know, they, they, they're changing still regularly because they used to be called, you know, BIM level two certification and they're now called something different. So I can't say that we would ever hang our hat on anything like that. Mm -hmm. As I said, sort of in, in my sort of points earlier, I, we, we do tend to see more of a, the qualifications coming from within a particular profession or discipline and then the mm -hmm. across the BIM. Now I'm not saying that's the right way to go, but I do think that gives a certain um, provenance to, you know, you've lived it, you've done it, and, and that's where you're going. But, but I, I definitely think we, we at BDP, we need to be looking at how we can take graduates and, and, and developing them so that we don't have to rely on them almost opting in from a different profession. Okay. And maybe just to expand on that, there's another question that's related from Josh uh, Crystal. So do you agree that degree level accreditors like REBA and CIAT are doing enough to drive the BIM modules on their courses? In particular, Reba, you know, do they truly understand the value of BIM to make it a to make it a core part of their curriculum? And I suppose the add-on to that is, should it be a core part of their curriculum? So, Elliot, what do you think? Uh, I'm probably biased. I was recently made a fellow of the CIAT, um, so I will sing the CIAT's praises. But I think actually, sort of architectural technology as a profession sometimes struggles to know where it belongs. And, and I think this has been a fantastic opportunity for that profession to, to find its place. And I think its place is really at the intersects of all of our professions. It, it's kind of about linking and almost the conduit between designers, engineers, and, and, and everything else to, to glue it all together. So that seems like a natural fit with um, kind of BIM as the process that, that sort of greases the wheels. Mm -hmm. And I'd also say the graduates that are coming out of some courses uh, that the CIAT accredit, I think, are fantastic. Um, the RIBA, I suppose there's less emphasis on this, but I think it is building. I think there's, the, the RIBA typically um, are driven down a, you know, a graphical and a visual and a, you know, the sort of the, um, the, the design approach. Um, but equally, you know, that is, that is, still the majority of our business is, is architectural mm -hmm. so i think you know i think it naturally it will it will build and it will become more robust and more integrated um but yeah I, that's great that's great thank you and next question we've got uh, i'm going to direct towards trevor and um, this is coming in from craig howell at, at delux um, so how much of a barrier is encountered by the lack of understanding of digital transformation from within a business um, when it comes to retaining good BIM staff. So discussing sort of salary compensation versus sort of encounter change resistance. Right, okay, who am I going to answer this one? So uh, I'm part of a big multidisciplinary business and there is still, I must admit, um, an education piece that's, that I'm trying to consistently do to bring other discipline directors, sector directors, wider parts of the business up to speed when it comes to BIM and, and delivery of. And we've still got a battle when it comes to tendering, that um, maybe the BIM element of things, the processes that are in place, uh, don't get as much um, emphasis as they should. And um, maybe the fees aren't aligned as such. So trying to get um, a big behemoth of a business like I work for up to that to kind of knowledge level is, is difficult. Um, but we do have good communication links with the rest of the business to try and achieve that. Um, 
when it comes to salaries and and grading of them it, it all comes down to what is the client willing to pay for you know how are we going to be competitive in the market against the competitors and deliver the quality service that we know we can deliver using the BIM workflows and if we can do that and be competitive and continue to win work then we can get the value into into the the BIM team and therefore our, our profile gets higher and higher as it mm -hmm. has been doing through the various disciplines. Um, but it is still uh, the clients that we need to uh, upskill as, as Chris mentioned before. Um, particularly, you know, I'm thinking of, of ones in, in the uh, National Grid, for instance, have, have got some projects that are, are very pitching BIM way up here somewhere and some projects have got zero BIM on it whatsoever and really I think it should be somewhere in the middle so they're adding value all the way through and if we can if we can educate clients a bit better as Chris mentioned before then there's more likelihood of his our um, profile increasing in there for our salaries on the, on the base of that. Oh, that's good and I'll, I'll maybe bring uh, Gary into this so Gary and in, in your intro you mentioned that um you know, it's a real challenge sort of proving the return on investment, you know, commercial teams not fully understanding the intangible value. Um, so that, that's kind of linked to this question of, you know, how, how you, you, we look at digital transformation when we come within a business. So what, what's your take on that? So, so I set out to, 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 to prove that, that it worked because it was in my interest to do that. So I headed up uh, digital for, for, for Wilmot Dixon and, um, I was adamant that we would we would start to to show the metrics because what we had was piecemeal. If we applied a thousand pounds to every clash, would that equate to you know the value bring? Well, that doesn't always work. So so what we did we looked at every project and we looked and we separated digital projects and non digital projects and said right how much profit on average did we make on the digital versus the non digital? How much time did it take us to deliver a hundred k turnover on digital non digital? Uh, and how much quality, so we, we had a, um, a cost of error on a project. So cost of error on every project, digital, non-digital, and uh, netted down all of these figures to actually come up with a, and it took a while, it didn't happen overnight, but we monitored it on a monthly basis. But actually after a while, about a year and a half, those metrics started to go into the positive, that on average we were quicker, that on average we were delivering better quality, that on average we were delivering more profit. And that just proved you're never going to see it on one project that you're on. You don't feel it. A lot of, a lot of it was the commercial team and some of the production teams knew they're on a BIM level two project, but they didn't feel they were seeing the benefits. So you had to take a more holistic view. But that, that's how I did it. And that's how we communicated to the business. This thing is working, but you're not feeling it on your project, but it is working as the, on a business as a whole. That's great. Thank you, Gary. So the next one I'm going to direct to, to Alex, and it's a question from Rapinder, and it's to do with specialism of, uh, of, of roles uh, and, and attractiveness. So he agrees with the panellists that the BIM roles need to transform into digital roles. Um, uh, and as such, will we see project-based BIM roles becoming less attractive and those pushing innovation becoming more attractive, i.e. those who are sort of in technical and engineering roles? Uh, rather than a uh, know-how rather than those in information management know-how so I suppose to summarize that is do you think we're going to see continuing specialization in information management in BIM or do you see that pulling back into traditional roles uh, you know innovative people in traditional engineering and architectural roles uh, I can answer that more in two parts really so to, uh, to answer the one part of, the, of that question um, I think project-based BIM roles uh, more, more going from the BWE perspective, so when, when I see projects, I see more site-based and actually being involved with projects from start to finish. Um, that's something that actually that we are doing more and more of. There's a lot less time spent in, in, in head office um, or, or working from home for BIM coordinators uh, and BIM managers for us and actually usually being on site where the action is. So, uh, and the drive for that is because we don't, just want BIM coordinators to be specialists in information management. We want them to actually understand construction and their part in a, in a, in a project you know, from the beginning and to be able to work closely with the rest of the team. Um, and then, so the second part of, the, of that question regarding um, people with technical, engineer, technical or engineering knowledge 
be more attractive. Yeah, I definitely would agree there. I think that the special I I think that the specialization in um in information management I think will continue. I think there will be hopefully a level five apprenticeship at in information management um in the in the future so people can have that knowledge but people who understand things like either MEP or architecture or civil engineering and have a more general construction knowledge to go with their specialized knowledge are going to be extremely attractive candidates in the future mm-hmm. and now to be honest that's great that's great so Trevor I know you need to leave at 11 but I'm going to bounce this one to you as well do you as somebody who's managing a a multidisciplinary BIM consultancy team as well as looking inwards what's your view on the specialization of of roles do you think it will continue or do you think it will change I think it will continue at the moment I think um, the the specialist skills you need in terms of data and managing of that data and understanding how databases work and the checking of that is um, quite quite a specialist skill that that doesn't naturally fit within um, the other disciplines. So I think what will happen is that the geometry side of things, mm-hmm. clash detection and, and everything else, that will that will fade into the disciplines um, remit in terms of going through those workflows. But I think the data side of things and understanding how that data then feeds into the client's databases and the wider network of information to make sure the information is of value when we hand it over, I think that will still be specialised more into the information management side of things. That's great. Well, thank you very much for your input, Trevor. Cheers. No problem. Okay, so next... if I, can I just come in on that one? Because I think I totally echo what Trevor says there. And I think there's a there's a challenge for us because things like data management, uh, you know, I don't think we necessarily know where these skills come from. I don't, you know, if, if you're looking at the way we recruit and, and, the, and the forums we use, we tend to get people from various courses and various backgrounds. But data management, you know, data architecture, even the example of kind of visualization now, you know, we do a lot of work with Unreal Engine and and, and that as almost a games developer background. Mm. You know, it's not naturally an architect that would want to go and do that. So you've got to look, you've got to broaden the horizons. And then the challenge is, how do you make our industry attractive to people who perhaps would get paid more in what they were trained to do? Uh, and, 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 And construction is still seen as sort of, you know, a slightly strange decision for them in their their career path and i think that will expand into lots of different subjects like you know data architecture data management we, we, we're lucky that we've got a business systems team in-house that manage our finance systems and there's this massive overlap now with us starting to use automation around things like model health checks but the data gathering from that we do a lot of work in, in forge now with autodesk the data we're gathering we're working with our business systems team to see how you can visualize it. And, and that is like a totally left field sort of specialist area that we just happen to have that skill in house because of probably because of the size we are. But, you know, where would you find that from otherwise? You know, how do we, how do we, how do we entice those kinds of, kinds of people into our businesses? I don't know. No, that's great. Um, so we're going to run over. Um, if, if anyone needs to leave, feel free to leave. We're going to run for an extra five minutes. Um, Chris, I'm going to pull you into a question. But, and the reason I'm going to pull you in because we, we operate in very different businesses. So the next question is about the north-south divide when we're talking about salaries that we're paying our, our staff. Now, yeah. I work for a very large business. So there's 8,000 odd people in the UK. So I'm, I'm very aware of this divide uh, and the issues that it causes. Um, that's primarily to do with uh, the cost of living expenses from in the south to the north and also to do with uh, the cost of actually running a business and having these assets and facilities in, in the south. So as a, a small business, I'm not sure where you have offices. Where, where do you, what's well, your our, view our on our this? Office north in, our, our office is in central Manchester. Yep. And um, the, yeah, the office rent is lower than central London. But the living costs are normalising very quickly. I will say, we run on projects from the south coast to the top of Scotland to the Netherlands, and our rates are the same. Mm-hmm. So if we're earning the same, we pay similar amounts. Okay? We, we don't charge more for doing a job in London. We might charge more expenses to go there, but we help people there as well. Um, I'm seeing less and less of a north-south divide. I'm seeing more of a divide between... Um, employment experience. 
it's uh, I think it's normalizing very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I know it's hard to believe that things happen outside the M25 for a lot of people, but um, you know, we really are cracking on. Yeah, yeah. That's not that, that I think I think it is. Um, and I think the less reliance on a uh, actual buildings you know we're all working working virtually just now that's going to continue as well as a trend so that, that's an interesting one to follow i think it's a it, it will be fascinating to see because i think the question talks about the last 18 months and i think it, it's fascinating to see how how life will be like you know when, whenever we get back to whatever is you know the next the next, the next if there is you know inevitably there's going to be some kind of flexible working policy around it's, it's very true. We, uh, with great foresight, signed a five-year lease a week before lockdown one. And uh, <laughs> it's nice to be in the office. Um, and, you know, we've, we've actually grown in that time. We've, we've grown and we uh, plan to grow again to more desks than we've got in it. But our thinking is now that let's have a hub. Let's make it really nice. We're going to have hybrid working. Let's keep the overheads low. Use that money to invest in quality people. That's certainly the way we're thinking about it. That's great. And uh, I think we've got time for one final question that I'd like to direct to to Andy, particularly because you mentioned the soft skills, Andy. Mm. Um, so the next one is, how important are the sort of social skills needed for the implementation of technology and processes? And if you think it's important, how do you support your current management to upskill their social skills uh, with digital mm. technology? That's a really good question, and that's yeah, that's right up my uh, my street actually. So absolutely, and I think we talked about earlier. You know, what what do you look for in you know bringing candidates in for for whether whether you call them a BIM role, a digital role, whatever that is. Um, again, it's really resilience is is a, is a key attribute for all of us, and we'll probably all have a, a um, you know we, we have to. You're essentially trying to sell the dream to to your colleagues, aren't you? Really, <clears throat> in as part of the job trying to get people to, to embrace new ways of working. And then, of course, you're going to get continuous knockbacks. Um, so you, you have to keep picking yourself up and, and just going at it. Um, and, and, and those soft skills are so important. You know, good communication, fundamental to anything in this, in this. Well, fundamental to anything we do, isn't it, really, in construction? But certainly in, the, in these kind of roles, um, I'd, I'd, I'd take a, a, you know, a good, good communicator, um, uh, good, good approach, attitude, enthusiasm over technical skills in any day of the week. You can learn those. Um, but yeah, so so if, yeah, absolutely important. And it's interesting. The question then flips to to actually management. How do we upskill them? Because yeah, that you know the leadership has to understand the need to to be able to support, invest, and 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 train you know the, the staff to deliver this stuff. So. Um, I mean, actually, something we're doing in <clears throat> I'm doing at the moment in in Keir is um, we, we've brought in uh, an external provider to do sort of e-learning training around information management um, based around the 19650 series, um, but actually covering some of those principles as well, um, what a bit wider than just the standards. Um, and and I won't say the name because it would be unfair, but um, you, some of you might know who that is. But um, we we've actually I've just had approval to get all of our senior leadership to do some uh, an element of those courses so there's a you know because there's still a huge misconception at leadership level about you know just say bim and, and i hate to keep saying it 3d model and and trying to dispel that no it is about processes about information management um you know forget the the the, <laughs> the, the other stuff you just need to understand that and how it can improve so so yeah we're quite pleased that our you know you know our top directors will be going through those courses and and actually having a bit of an understanding to be then be able to support the their staff to, to upskill and deliver. So yeah, really important. No, that's great. Thank you very much, Andy. So I think we'll, we'll bring that to a close. Um, finally, thank you all to all our panel members for taking the time out of their busy day to, to answer all the questions posed. Um, as far as I'm aware, a recording will be made available on the DBE Careers website of this session uh, for anyone that couldn't meant it, couldn't make it or, or is looking for a recap. And uh, finally, thank you all to, to all the listeners for, for all your questions and I hope you find it of value. Have a great day. Thank you very much.